What is up, wrestling fans? Welcome to another pay-per-view point edition of the Smart Cow Moment Smack Talk Podcast. It's time for us to talk about WWE Survivor Series 2019 because it just went down a few minutes ago and we have all our first impressions fresh in our minds. So we're going to talk about everything from top to bottom of the card, all the results, all the recap, all the review, all the other stuff like that. Who are we? Well, I'm your host as always, Tony Mango, and joining me as always is Robert DeFelice. Hey, Tony, how you doing? Did you survive the Survivor Series? Let me check my pulse real quick. Wait, what? Actually, I can't find it. <laughs> this, wait, I'm like, legitimately, I can't find it on my wrist right now. That's, uh... This is getting increasingly <laughs> more... <laughs> All right, let me check my neck. All right, I got I got one in my neck. <laughs> okay. All right, Tony is alive. I might need to get some checked out. This is kind of... Huh. All right, donate to the Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that's a good way to start things off. Um, yeah, if you think you know what's going on with the fact that I can't find my pulse in my left wrist or my right one, either one of them, if you're a doctor, then leave a comment below and uh, tell us your thoughts on not only that, but Survivor Series. We invite everybody to tell us your thoughts on Survivor Series. So if you are on the audio-only platforms, such as iTunes or Google Play or Spotify or Stitcher or uh, WebMD, which I need to go to, I guess, <laughs> then, you know, hop on over to the YouTube page. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button if you haven't done that already. Ring that little bell for the notifications. Like the video because that helps out quite a bit. And as I mentioned, drop a comment below and tell us your thoughts on everything that's going down here. Uh, we will talk about some other kind of plugs later on. I mentioned the Patreon, but we'll dive into that a little bit more. And... Yeah, so Survivor Series. Um, we were talking last night how if we were like positive or negative leading into this, and we were all kind of leaning more on the positive side of things. And I think overall, you know, we've got a little bit of some things to talk about on the negative side, but I think that we're both kind of in agreement here. This was this was a fun pay per view. I really enjoyed it. I got to tell you, it's one of the first pay per views in a long time. I got to just sit down and watch and enjoy, and I had a really good time. I didn't get a chance to quite do that, but I still enjoyed it. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think were the major highlights. Some of the things that there were some parts of this that I wasn't a big fan of. Um, One of the things I liked was that they added two matches to the kickoff. The first one was the cross-branded tag team battle royal. Which I told featured, you. yeah, I was like, God damn it. After talking about the whole, like, they're not going to do that, all that kind of stuff. And then I'm like, there's the fucking Battle Royal. Rob was right. Uh, they featured most of the tag teams, but not all of them. And I do want to call attention to some of the tag teams that weren't in this because some of them, it pretty much shows you the way that WWE thinks of them. So AOP wasn't in this, but I would assume. There's no uh, explanation for this other than the fact that why would they put AOP in a battle royal? They want them to be a bigger deal, and they don't want them to lose. Right. So that's okay. The Ascension wasn't in this. They have not done anything in a long while. And they weren't even addressed on the draft. Can we kind of rule out the idea that they're even employed at this point? I don't think you can blow out the idea that they're employed, but it's it's not looking good for them. I'm going to look it up on cage match because I know the clones weren't in this match either. And the last time I looked them up, they hadn't done anything in well over a year. I think the last match that they had wrestled was something like, I don't know, like uh, July 2018 or something like that. So I don't know if the Ascension quite falls uh, falls into the same kind of th- territory, but I don't remember them doing anything. So Victor, at the very least, I don't think Connor has any kind of different setup because it looks like pretty much every match is Connor and Victor. Why would they do singles matches? Victor's last match was main event on the 8th of um, April. And they were both in the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal. And they've done main event, main event, live show, live show, live show. So they haven't even wrestled on the live events since April. I mean, that's kind of indicative of them just not being a part of this anymore. 
Yeah, Connor, same thing. Wow. That goes Maybe to show they how little it was. Maybe they resurface when they do uh, Southpaw again. What did they do in that? They, weren't they the surfing dudes? Mm, I don't remember for sure. I don't even remember what they, they did on uh, what they do on Southpaw, and they really did. Yeah, I, I really like. I guess they're just sort of sitting out their contract, and. At that point, why wouldn't WWE just release them? You know, clearly they're not going to push them. They're not even using them for house show stuff, which at the very least, that would have been a good use for them. Same thing with the clones. They haven't done anything. So why bother with that? Looking through the Raw roster right now, I'm not seeing any other tag teams other than the Usos, which they're out because of the whole legal issues and all those problems. But no other tag teams missing on there. Some of the singles competitors like Rusev, Bobby Lashley, Cedric Alexander... Uh, no Way Jose, you know, all those Sean Benjamin. Uh, on the SmackDown side of things, I think the Colognes is the only... Oh, no, the B-Team wasn't in this. What were they? I don't think so. I don't remember seeing them in there. So maybe they, they missed out on that a little bit. And the Hardy Boys, of course, but Jeff's got his issues going on right now, too. And then for NXT, like, we didn't get the Brit and Bruisers because Tony Lorcan requested his release. But we got the Forgotten Sons, we got Imperium, we didn't get Gallus, we didn't get Grizzled Young Veterans, we didn't get some of the other ones from NXT UK, like South Wales Subculture, but it still was a matter of, let's get a bunch of tag teams in here and let's just do another points tally kind of thing. And it ended up being Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler winning by uh, last eliminating the Street Profits. But you know what? I liked it. I was surprised that it went to these two, but it almost kind of goes, well, it is Ziggler. He is a former multi-time world champion. I guess he should get a bone every now and again. And this is that bone. I was surprised that it wasn't a team of Raw, a team of NXT, and a team of SmackDown at the end. That bothered me. That really made me concerned for the rest of the night. And even Callum messaged the group and was like, Oh, well, I guess we can expect to see NXT not involved in any of the finishes tonight. Lo and behold, completely different story. <laughs> yeah. But it threw me off a little bit because I my brain still functioned to the Street Profits as being part of Team NXT. And I was like sitting there thinking to myself, oh, okay, well, if they win, then it's... And then I'm like, no, wait, they're Team Raw. They weren't red. I should have known that, but... I like the addition to this, and I like the addition for overall, for the most part, of the NXT Cruiserweight Championship Triple Threat match. It was Leo Rush as part of NXT against Akira Tozawa for Raw and Kalisto for SmackDown. It doesn't make a whole lot of logical sense, because if Tozawa or Kalisto would have won the title, then they would have, I guess, gone down to NXT, or yeah. been holding an NXT title on Raw or SmackDown, and that's a little weird, but we all knew Leo Rush would win this anyway, just because that's illogical and uh you know it was an extra thing not bad cruiserweights they're fine yeah people weren't really into this one but i enjoyed it it's like it's unoffensive you know it's not gonna be the best match of the night and by no means do i remember anything that really happened in it but it's extra it's the pre-show if you missed the pre-show oh my voice cracked there <laughs> if you missed the pre-show uh, i'm 14 uh and you missed the match, I don't think you're going to go back and check it out. And you don't have to. But, you know, if you're there and you just are bullshitting with some friends and you want to see some extra matches on top of it, it's cool. So I liked it. And it gave NXT another win. So that's another good thing. Surprisingly, then they went with the triple threat with the tag team champions. Viking Raiders, Undisputed Era, and the Revival. Or the Revival. Uh, the New Day. Why do I have it down as the Revival? That's weird. Because you never changed it. <laughs> I guess I didn't update little, that little part. Um, um, yeah, suck it, Raw. Your only victory was on the pre-show. Uh, I guess it doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, you suck. Now you're going to have to hold up uh, your wear a t-shirt that says four and two and one. <laughs> Get you know, wants to do that. Let's, let's talk about that real quick. I really enjoyed that it was a Survivor series. It was a series of matches, and they kept score. I really like that. Yeah, it's amazing how 
when you give a gimmick of points are supposed to be heading towards something and then you don't just go, nah, points don't matter, that it's like, okay, now we're actually kind of invested in the idea that, all right, now it's one and zero and two and whatever and, you know. I made the joke on, uh, I think it was the Bleacher Report article of, uh, or maybe it was elsewhere, I don't know, of just like, all right, well, like, SmackDown's got a point, but it's on the pre-show, so I don't know if that counts. <laughs> it's... But it was one, one, and one. The Viking, uh, Viking Raiders won this. Honestly, No member of the Undisputed Era should ever be on the kickoff. That was my takeaway from the whole thing. It was a fine match. Kofi shouldn't be on any kickoffs either. He won the goddamn title at WrestleMania, but whatever. Honestly, I didn't think it was as good as it was supposed to be. It would have been better without the Viking Raiders, I think. Yeah, I, and that kind of applies to any of these things. I kind of feel like any of these triple threat matches would have been better if it was just any pairing of the two. Like Viking Raiders against New Day, Viking Raiders against Undisputed Era, Undisputed Era against New Day. I think any of that would have been better. Because the triple threats, they were a little hard to keep track of. Not only for me, but like for the referees and stuff. And they really got formulaic by the end of the night, but I'll get to what I thought of the main event later. Uh, yeah, this match was fine. Didn't offend me. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's good, but I'm not writing it down on any th- kind of list. Yeah. Now, kind of uh, similar to what happened at TakeOver, we started off with the 5-1-5-1-5 Women's Survivor Series Elimination Triple Threat Match, Team Raw, Team NXT, Team SmackDown, and uh, now we actually know who the people were going into it and everything like that. Same thing with the men later on. It ended up being one of my favorite matches of the night. And I have my my little nitpicks that I want to say. Like, I'm not a fan of the idea that Io Shirai and Candice LeRae were taken out of the match to come back in later on. I agree. I didn't like that. Uh. But one of the good things about this was, and this is something that I feel this match overall, I think, was better than the men's one, because I feel like everybody had a chance to do something here. And it wasn't just a matter of they had a chance to do their one move. Like Carmilla had a moment in there where she was trying to pin Bianca and I think it was Charlotte, if I'm remembering correctly. I know Bianca was in there a lot of times with Charlotte, so So, that could be it. The, she was trying to pin one and then the other and then the other and the other and she was getting frustrated like she had her little moment there and uh, you know Bianca had her couple of moments she eliminated two different people there was a furthering of the Asuka and Charlotte Flair stuff which that I will need to kind of talk about because Charlotte acted like a bitch and then they made Asuka seem like the villain And I really don't know what they want to do with Charlotte. They want her to not stop being the queen, but also be a baby face. They're exactly where they were with her this time last year when they put her against Ronda. It's kind of annoying because now we know that it pretty much is going to be the women's tag titles. uh, Kabuki Warriors against Flair and Lynch. Which is... um... I'm not bothered by that at all. I think that's great business. I think all three brands can now have Charlotte and Becky at any point in time. I think that's that's an awesome idea. That depends on if they win the titles. Yeah, but I'm assuming they do because she's Charlotte fucking Flair. There's a couple things that happened tonight that make me think that maybe things aren't as uh, easy to predict. So... I think uh, by the end of December, we're going to look back on this and either be like, oh, it's obvious that it's this, where it's like, wow, we have no fucking idea. But at least with this, it's like, okay, they're furthering the Asuka stuff. It's going to be Asuka and Charlotte and the whole thing carrying on. And But I do like that they incorporated that because if they're going to go in that direction, Survivor Series should have moments that lead towards that, you know? So I did like that. Uh, What else we got here? Like... uh. Kyrie Sane eliminated by Sasha Banks. Data Brock eliminated by Asuka. Asuka does that whole thing. Lacey Evans why was taken it, Why out. did it take so long to get rid of Dana Brock? Eh, just one of those things. Eh. Uh, Bianca put up a little bit of a fight. She lasted quite a while. 
eventually got taken out by Sasha. Tony Storm taps out to a double submission from Natty Which and I Sasha. Which I thought was awesome. Yeah, like the that. only thing I didn't like, and you know why this happens, but it's illogical. There's a moment where, first of all, the double submission, and then immediately Bianca gets hit with the heart attack by Sasha and Natty. And it's like, Rhea, you know you can help your teammate, but obviously, you know, we have to move the night along here. Yeah. And she's all like, oh, no. Oh, what you can do? kick out. Do it. Kick out. Oh, wait, you didn't kick out. But then EO and Candice come back in. And at that point, it's like, all right, NXT's winning. And they all survive. You know, no sole survivor Rhea Ripley situation. But Rhea Ripley gets the win for the team and furthers that whole agenda we were talking about where it's like, man, Rhea Ripley strapping a rocket on her. I don't think anybody had a better weekend than Rhea Ripley. I think Adam Cole owned the month, but Rhea Ripley's right behind him, and Rhea Ripley owned this weekend. The three big takeaways for Raw, SmackDown, and NXT for this past like Survivor Series build are Rhea Ripley, Adam Cole, and Keith Lee. Keith Lee, we will get to, but yeah. Keith fucking Lee. So Team NXT wins this. They are up by one point, and I enjoyed the match quite a bit. And that's not going to be my match of the year type of thing. I still think War Games was better, but I did like this match a lot. Uh, I like this match. It made me want a lot more of Rhea on the main roster and a lot more of, like, Rhea, and there was Charlotte, and then there was Sasha, and... I enjoyed the stuff with the Kabuki Warriors. It's going to kind of suck when the rosters go back to their canon universes and we go back to some stale matchups. Because this weekend and tonight in particular was very fun because it all felt fresh. Yeah, and once we get to... Well, you know what, though? It's not going to be that long. That's what's, like, one of the good things. Because... We are going to get December and the whole TLC thing, and then we get the Royal Rumble, and there is a little bit of back and forth with that. It's not going to be the same. It's, NXT is probably not going to be a part of it. Then again, maybe they are. I don't know. They could do that. They could just be like, you know what? All three brands fight in the Royal Rumble, and you could get a championship shot for any of the three. Or, you know, some other Ten from Raw, like ten from SmackDown, ten from NXT. <laughs> I'd be okay with that, honestly. I don't think they're going to go that far. I would be more than fine with that if they did. Because I don't even think that they do 15 and 15 for Raw and SmackDown. They used to. I think that now they're just sort of like, here's the 30 people we want. Because they want to do, like, surprise person comes back, and this person... I mean, last year they had the whole, like, Nia Jax is in the men's one for no fucking reason, like, you know. Well, but, it's still this year. Don't put me in 2020 already. But yeah. That's nah, last year to me. <laughs> Yeah, at the same time, it's still March. So (laughs) then we had a backstage segment. Seth Rollins was bringing up the idea that he's not sure if he could trust Kevin Owens, who, you know, quid pro quo. He mentions the idea that Seth Rollins turns on his teammates in the past. So I like that segment. That was a nice little bit of continuity. I thought that was very good. And it made me think Kevin Owens, Seth Rollins could be a major feud on Monday Night Raw. Not too sure if I want to see that, though. I, but then something later in the night made me think maybe that won't happen. So we'll get to it. Well, Owens did say NXT doesn't need him. Raw desperately does, which I think that that's as much of a confirmation as you could possibly get that he's not going down to NXT. I think they made it clear that he can definitely take that path should he ever want to. Just not now. No. I think when he said they need him, it was almost like an admission of, yeah, Raw really does need some major people right now. Yeah. All the more reason why I think that he should be the guy that uh, fights for the title at WrestleMania. Definitely not Seth Rollins. Uh, What do we have after that? We had the um, AJ Styles, Roderick Strong, and Shinsuke Nakamura. Another match that I thought was good, but it didn't meet my expectations. 
I loved this match. I thought it was probably the best match of the night. I I loved everything about it. Are there any particular like things that stood out? Because I don't remember like almost anything that happened. Uh, for some reason, the one spot that really sticks out to me is the doomsday device, but like Shinsuke. Oh, the kick! Yeah, where kick. he fell on top of Styles. Yeah, and he kind of fell on his knee, or Roddy fell on his knee, and yeah, I like that spot a lot. I just liked the flow of the match. It didn't blow my mind, but it also didn't underwhelm me, which is good when you're talking about the main WWE product. So at this point in the night, Roderick Strong wins, and it's like, oh, wow, NXT has three points. Yeah, at that point, I started messaging the Fightful crew, like, wait, can we start writing up that NXT is one? Because at that point, the best any other brand can do is a tie. Yeah, and I did not expect to see that coming. I figured they would... Because, I mean, the logical thing is to have it be even throughout the whole night so that it's like, oh, who's going to end up getting the one extra point kind of a thing. That did upset me. They made it a point, Tony, to put seven matches on this card so that you could do the two, two, and two, and then it all comes down to this. And yet for the second year in a row, by the time we got to that last match, it was a foregone conclusion, and the last match was almost meaningless. Wasn't it a third uh, year in a row? Because wasn't the 2016 or, yeah, or 2017 or whatever the first one that they hadn't done? Didn't they do the same thing, too? Wasn't it like that Raw was up by two or something? Probably. I kind of remember that being the case. I don't know 100% for sure. If you know, drop a comment below. But we had that. Match was good. Again, you liked it better than I did. But that's not to say that I disliked the match because I didn't. So. No poo-poo went on all over that. They made a backstage segment, which I thought that this was very interesting. This was uh, The Miz talking to Daniel Bryan, and he was telling him that they kind of needed to put their differences aside and acknowledge the fact that Bray Wyatt needs to be stopped. You know, the like mature, honorable, babyface type of thing to do. And Daniel Bryan tells him, fuck off. Well, he says, get out of my face. He doesn't say fuck off, but... This is basically just a means to say these two are going to be in a feud with Bray Wyatt. Like, we're getting a triple threat at TLC. And we're definitely getting Miz and Bryan again. And I think that that might include the Intercontinental title down the line. I don't know. It depends on when they decide to do it. But I liked that they made the Miz look like a better person here. Instead of, like, because I know everybody was saying, like, well, did he turn heel and all that other kind of stuff. Now it's like, no, he is a baby face. They just don't like each other. But even that, he was willing to kind of put his differences aside and all that. So I like that. That was a good little touch. I agree. I like anything these two do together. These two have chemistry that you just can't make up. So we had Adam Cole against Pete Dunne for the NXT Championship following this. And... Was this your favorite match? Nope. Huh. I liked this one a lot, too. I mean... I liked it, yeah. Foregone I mean... conclusion, totally, but I liked this match a lot. It took a little bit for it to get started, I think, for the crowd to warm up, because they were kind of dead after the last bunch of sl- uh, stuff that had happened. But by the time they started to warm up to it, it got really good. And, I mean, I'm not surprised. Like, Adam Cole's great. Pete Dunne's great. You put them th- the two of those together, and it's like... It's going to work out. So it's not going to be, again, another match of the year type thing. But I liked it. So, hey, no complaints. You know, I like it when I like things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got peanut butter, you got chocolate, you put them together. You got Reese's. They're yeah. fantastic. You get a couple of those in pieces, and it's called Reese's Pieces, not Reesey Peasy. I fucking hate it when people do that. <laughs> Unless you're Canadian, then it actually is Reesey PC. Really? Yeah. It's it's Reese over there. Well, then it would just be Reese pieces. <laughs> That's even weirder. I don't know. If you're Canadian and you have an explanation for that, go ahead and drop a comment below. Uh, really quickly, let me toss out 
the plug about the merchandise, because why not? I don't know. Uh, Tee Public and Redbubble. Check those stuff out. See if you want to pick up a t-shirt or any other types of merchandise we have. There are three different shops for both of those different types of shops. A Mango Tees, Fanboys Anonymous, and Smart Cat Moment. So if you want to pick up something maybe for like a uh, Christmas gift or, you know, whatever, I don't know, then go ahead and pick that up. Unfortunately, this is the lowest point of the night for me. The Universal Championship match between Bray Wyatt and Daniel Bryan. My thoughts on the website is just z z z z z. Wasn't a fan. I hate the let uh, the red lights. Anytime that Bri- uh, Bray Wyatt was in control, I was bored. Anytime that Daniel Bryan was fighting back, I was just like, eh, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. This did nothing for me. I think you didn't like the fact that it was. Again, I've used this phrase a lot tonight, but a foregone conclusion and The Fiend was going to win. I liked this match. I thought Brian did a very good job of doing what he was supposed to do. And it looks like the Yes movement is back, right? It should be. He's doing the Yes, Yes, Yes. Uh, Nasty mandible claw finish. I I like the I'm gonna catch you in midair and I'm gonna kneel on your arm so you're not moving, you're not getting up. I just don't think that I like. The I guess at this point I could just say it. I don't think I like Bray Wyatt. Yeah, it's it's one of those things again, like we were talking about last night with Dane. I think your your mind is made on Bray Wyatt, and it's not changing. Because I like when The Undertaker does his stuff. And there is, like, a, a parallel between some of these. But I know for, like, for a fact, I hate those red lights. And I know yeah, that the crowd was stupid. chanting normal lighting. Which is just like, okay, stop with the whole red light thing. They tried this before. They tried it 20 years ago with Kane. He used to do the, okay, all my matches are going to have red lights. And they, they stopped tried that. With, they tried it with Sin Cara, And it didn't work. Okay. And they stop that, like, stop doing this. The red light thing, or any kind of lights like that, they make it hard for people to see. And we were talking about this because uh, Elimination Chamber is going to be in Philly. So, talking to a couple of friends of mine about the idea that we might go, and then we were like, oh, crap, that's right, though. If they end up trying to put an Elimination Chamber in there, and it ends up being that Bray Wyatt's the champion, we won't be able to see jack shit. Imagine trying to look through the chamber in the red lights. I made, I imagine that by the time we get to Chamber, it'll be long gone. It should have been gone from the very start. The red lights should only happen when you attack somebody. These matches are just, they, they don't work that way. Because the first match didn't have red lighting. Right? When he fought Balor, it was normal lighting. It was? I don't remember. Yeah. And then they did that for Hell in a Cell, which is like, okay, you're trying to be spooky. It's October. And then they continue to do that and I, I think they need to stop i just didn't like the action of the match itself even with the lights like i'm not excited to see any more bray wyatt now i think that this pretty much the ship sailed the character is just bray wyatt but with a mask and he no sells for certain things he wrestles the same basic style i'm over it i, I want it not only do i want a new champion I kind of want Bray Wyatt to just get, like, released. I think that this whole experiment's kind of past me. I know that I'm in the minority. I know that a lot of people really like The Fiend, but I got a feeling that eventually people are going to come on board with the same kind of idea. Just like, all right, it's old. Maybe it'll happen around WrestleMania. Maybe it'll happen a little bit after that. I don't know. Yeah, I can't say I fully agree with your sentiment, but... I definitely don't feel as strongly about The Fiend as I did. I kind of just wish Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family stuck around. That was my favorite incarnation of Wyatt. I don't like him on his own. I don't feel what I felt for the Firefly Funhouse and the Fiend character. But that being said, I I don't know. I'm still willing to give it a chance. Really quickly, let me toss out the 
let's talk about the Patreon. I mentioned this earlier. Um, still not t- quite sure about that whole pulse, but we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, the Patreon is a great means to keep the lights on here. Not red lights, but, you know, actual metaphorical lights. And to make sure that we actually do some different special features that you would like to see. Because there is a Pick Your Poison tier where you can donate a... $50, I think it is, a uh, donation, and then I will make sure that we go ahead and do whatever it is that you have requested, within reason, of course. If it's like, I request you to do a four-month-long tournament, or I want you to do a fan ounce table of a seven-hour event, like, we can't really do that. But, you know, maybe you're a big fan of um, Finisher versus Finisher, and you want to see that come back, or something like that. You know, there's always a, you know, back and forth, so... Take advantage of that if you can. If not, even if you just toss a buck our way, it's greatly appreciated. And all that stuff can go a long way as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, I will try to figure out more about the dark match stuff. I know that that's something that I keep putting on the back burner, but more shit keeps happening. So it kind of keeps getting in the way. But at some point, hopefully for December, there will be a dark match on there. And you will be able to donate and listen to that because it'll be Patreon only. Just exclusive for the patrons. So. Keep that in mind and uh, do the same thing for Fanboys Anonymous because fanboysanonymous.com is my site for movie reviews and geek culture topics and we don't do enough on that. So if you want to make sure that I do more and you want us to do anything in particular over on that site, then donate to that Patreon. Same kind of deal. Let's move on to the 5-1-5-1-5 Men's Survivor Series Elimination Triple Threat Traditional Tag Team Turmoil Bonanza kind of match. And Team NXT was announced during the pre-show, and it consisted of Keith Lee, Matt Riddle, Tommaso Ciampa as the team leader. You've got Walter, which I didn't see coming, and Damian Priest. What about just the team itself, do you think, without getting into the match? I thought the team was... Good, except I'm not fully sold on Priest. Would you and have preferred Dane? <laughs> no, like that's the thing. I don't think I wanted either one. I think I had I had picked that team, but I had slotted Dijak in Priest's spot, right? Right. And yeah, I just I would have preferred Dijak. I like Dijak better, so I would have been cool with that. But I do like uh, Damian Priest more this weekend, more than I have in the past. So, that's a you know that's good. Walter though, first elimination, and it wasn't that far into the match. Yeah, that was something. This match had basically the same kind of problems that the other match avoided. Lots of people doing quick things, not really accomplishing much. Focusing on a couple different names more so than anything else. Walter, though, I mean, every year it seems like they pick somebody and they just kind of job them out, sort of. Like, Walter didn't even get double teamed to get the pin. I, I took solace in the idea of maybe, possibly, in a dream world, Drew McIntyre can take his ass to NXT UK and do a match with Walter since he eliminated him so easily. I was very, very surprised about that. And the crowd seemed to not be a fan. They of were fu- the bullshit chance immediately started. I felt bad. That's Walter's first loss, right? Yeah, I guess so. That's weird. Now that led into a couple of other eliminations. We had, oh, wait, wait a minute. Hold on. Uh, Strowman got eliminated by counter. You couldn't do that for the undefeated Walter. Well, that, we got to talk about that. I'm going to put a pin in that for right now, though, because we had Shorty G taken out by Kevin Owens, and they did a good moment here where he was trying to figure out, should he jump on Ciampa or should he jump on Owen, uh, on uh, Shorty G? I like that. Yeah, and he chose Shorty G, and Shorty G didn't get to do much, but he did have a really good exchange with Matt Riddle, and it made me go, damn it, I want to take him seriously. <laughs> If Shorty G wasn't Shorty G, again, if Chad Gable was a couple inches taller, then he would never be in a position where he would have had to be fighting for his career. 
If Chad Gable is a couple inches taller, he'd be a WWE champion. At the very least, he'd be a, a mid card champion because he never won any of those mid card titles yet. Damn shame. So Kevin Owens gets taken out, out by Ciampa. Which was a really good moment of like, see, he didn't want to hit you, but but you hit him, and now at any point in time, Owens can say, what the fuck? I'm coming down to NXT to kick your ass. Priest gets taken out by Randy Orton, which... Uh, Deserve it. Yeah, I mean, and it's not like, like, you know, Priest getting pinned by Randy Orton. Nobody could be like, oh, they buried him. No, it's fucking Randy Orton. Like, if you're going to go out, you're going to go out to a 13-time world champion? Cool. On the That's flip the side of that, Matt Riddle eliminates Randy Orton. Yeah, Riddle eliminates Orton, and then Orton goes, hey, asshole, and gives him an RKO, and King Corbin pins Matt Riddle. I liked that exchange. Yep. And then one of the biggest moments of just, like, what the fuck, Braun Strowman gets eliminated by count out. Now, they did not do a count out for, if I remember correctly, any point on either of these two matches other than this. I know that they didn't do it after this, because I was trying to pay attention to that, and I was counting that the fact that Seth Rollins should have been counted out, Roman Reigns should have been counted out. This was stupid. Braun Strowman, I, I can't even think of who to compare him to. Maybe Kane, like in the early days of Kane, where it's like, we don't want to kill you, but we don't want you to win anything ever. So you're always going to lose to shenanigans. And they could have gotten away with it with him and Walter. Like, the two of them could have been brawling on the Just outside. Just brawled to the back, and it's like, all right, we're disqualifying both of them, or yeah. we're kicking them out. Maybe do something where they actually do use weapons, and the referees say that they're both disqualified. Now, I know that it's no disqualifications, because it's a triple threat, but hey, you know what there also was in, in a uh, triple threat match? Count. Uh, Countouts. <laughs> so, that was really dumb. I really hate when they just invent rules on the spot for in particular things. Cause then it makes all the other rules don't matter. Then it's just yeah. like, all right, well then at this point, why don't we have uh Drew McIntyre gets eliminated by going over the top rope, you know, just cause fuck it. We, that's what it means for this one. I hate when they do that. You know what though? I guess on Friday, Stroman will just go back to being the IC title challenger. And it's like, oh, tonight never happened. Again, it's a weird non-canonical night, except for, likely, NXT. See, I got a feeling that they're going to feed Strowman to Wyatt around, like, Royal Rumble time. Right now, we know that, like, the schedule means that more than likely we're not getting fast lane. So that's one less challenger that you need for the different champions. And, and I have to, like, mull over it a little bit more, try to figure out some predictions and everything. And, of course, I'm going to be trying to give predictions as soon as I can. And I'm going to – January 1st, there's always going to be the flood of every pay-per-view card that I can think of and potential things going on with all that. But we really only have to figure out TLC, Royal Rumble, Elimination Chamber, and WrestleMania. So for TLC, for instance, we were talking earlier, Daniel Bryan versus The Miz versus – uh. Bray Wyatt. Now we know that Starcade's coming up this next week, and if they stick to that card, there's supposed to be a steel cage match between The Miz and Bray Wyatt. And if they do that, then that's The Miz had a shot, Brian had a shot, do a triple threat TLC match or something. You need to figure out something for the Rumble, you need to figure out something for Elimination Chamber. I think Strowman's fighting him at Royal Rumble. And then I would hope that they would not do Bray Wyatt defending the title in an elimination chamber with those red lights. Big mistake if they do. We can all agree at this point it's Fiend versus Roman. It has to be. There's For the no record, I'm okay with that. that. I'm, uh, well, I'm okay with the Roman half of it. I don't know how I'm feeling about Wyatt. I just really want Roman back on top. And this match is a good start to that. I feel like it's going to blow up in everybody's faces. Uh, to piggyback off that, I think it started when 
it got down to Ciampa and Lee for NXT, Rollins for Raw, and Roman for SmackDown when Roman basically eliminated King Corbin for the other people. Which was a flip of what I had been saying. I was like, all right, Corbin's going to screw over Roman Reigns, and then that way they're going to end up uh, taking Team SmackDown out of the mix, and it's like, all right, no, Reigns is going to just have enough with King Corbin. Obviously, that means Corbin versus Reigns happening at TLC, just like we were expecting. But the crowd, very much pro-NXT. Listen, at least they justify it by having... Corbin be a complete dick and like tag himself in and then berate Roman for being dead weight. So like Roman just said, okay, fuck you. He cost Ali his spot when he tried to push him around. So Roman was already done with it. And, you know, no harm, no foul. But once it came down to, okay, it's the two shield guys against the two NXT guys. And Rollins is as hated as he is right now. It was like old times. Roman was getting booed to shit because people were upset that he was, you know, jumping on the Rollins bandwagon. Which, by the way, why have Seth Rollins be the one that pins Mustafa Ali? Because he was the only one left. No, Drew McIntyre still was. McIntyre didn't get eliminated by Roman until after Mustafa Ali was taken out. I guess because the curb stomp is cooler. That to me is one of those mistakes that I think that people working on the match didn't bother thinking ahead of. Because it's like he's coming out there as a guy from Chicago and you're working with Seth Rollins being booed lately. And if you want him to be a babyface, it's probably not a good idea for him to help uh, uh, for a heel to help him beat a hometown hero baby face. Like that would have been better off as Drew McIntyre, I think. Cause McIntyre needs the heat. Like McIntyre hasn't been doing shit. Yeah. I'd have gone with Drew McIntyre pinning Mustafa being all like, you know, in a haze and kind of taunting stuff and whatever, and then getting pinned by Roman. I would have gone that direction. Then we get Corbin taken out. We get Shema, uh, Champa taking out the whole thing we were just talking about, and it ends up being the final three: Rollins, Keith Lee, and Roman Reigns. Now I'm thinking to myself, okay, they're going to double team Keith Lee. It's going to be Rollins against Reigns. It's going to reiterate the point of these are our two big names, so the ones that we really want to get the point across. And Seth Rollins is going to beat Roman. Lo and behold, Seth Rollins gets pinned by Keith Lee, and I'm like, wow, okay, crowd fucking love that. Everybody love that. lost their fucking mind. When Keith Lee pinned Seth Rollins, Twitter blew up with, holy shit, he's a made man. Keith Lee is made. And admittedly, I was kind of like, I wish this was the final elimination just because Rollins is so hated right now. But then I immediately knew because at this point, if NXT had won this, it had been 4-1-1. And that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, so So, so, it's Reigns. And and Reigns does win, but they have a fucking banger of like a four minute match, and I thought it was great. I can't wait to watch them actually go one on one again. Yeah, talk about putting another person over. Like we said earlier, Rhea Ripley, hell of a week, hell of a month leading up into this whole thing. Keith Lee, man, what a! I never would have thought a month ago before they had announced that it was going to be Raw versus SmackDown versus NXT or whatever it was, that it would have been November 24th, and I'd be like, wow, Keith Lee kicking ass left and right on Raw and SmackDown on NXT on TakeOver on Survivor Series, and that they would put him over as much as they put him over. He lost, but, I mean, that's as good as you can get when you're losing. And I really appreciate that they did that. I thought it was one of the best moments of that. I can't say it was my favorite match because the full match itself wasn't great. But yeah. I thought that this exchange was my favorite of any exchange in the Survivor Series matches. This was just so good. And you know what's really funny? 
the past two years when they've done this whole champion versus champion thing, I've thought that the champion champion matches were better than the elimination matches because the elimination matches got a little bit too like they ran into those issues of, you know, the match starts off and somebody hits a super kick and they pin somebody and, oh my God, we already got one eliminated and whatever like that. And we kind of all thought that the triple threat 15 people would be like, this would be a mess. But I feel like this year, the Survivor Series matches were the way that they should be, basically, and that they were better than the champion versus champion matches versus champion. I would agree. I I wasn't overwhelmed by a lot of what happened in the tag team and women's champion versus champion versus champion. So even though I like the mid-card one, I like the two... Uh, Survivor Series matches more overall. Very interesting. Did not expect that. And I'm totally cool with being wrong about that because, hey, anytime you can take a fear and turn it into a positive for me, then cool. Then we had a... uh, We had the little Roman Reigns and Keith Lee bow and fist bump kind of thing. And that led into a promo from Becky Lynch, which I did my usual thing on the website of Becky Lynch promo, blah, blah. I don't remember anything that she said being any kind of thing for the... I thought it was a good promo, just in the sense of, like, I don't hear promos like that often these days where it's just straight to the camera. This is what I'm going to do. I'm not getting interrupted. There, you know, just a good wrestling promo. But before we go there, what did you think of the commercial for TLC? I did not think that that was going to be a commercial for TLC. I was wondering if something had happened and we switched it over to some kind of like other thing. I I really like the idea of Santa Santa's sleigh just dropping tables, ladders, and chairs everywhere. I thought that was funny. And Vince saying Merry Christmas. Yeah, that was great. Can you picture him being like dressing up as Santa for like the little kids? Like his like grandchildren i can see him enjoying it that would just like scar them you know <laughs> they'd be like this is what they think that santa's like and he's just kind of like oh god damn like you know just <laughs> ah, you need to get a little stronger there pal Where, where's the protein powder in this milk you left <laughs> rudolph with your nose so bright <laughs> like you look at thing. what right the now. hell is wrong with you you fucking brain <laughs> Oh, they let him. They let him play reindeer games. Oh no, they didn't. (laughs) (laughs) Really, uh, odd side note. This I don't know what this is going to say about myself, but eh, I'll, I'll tell people about it. So, in high school, I had a teacher who had this little uh plush alligator that he had named Gargamel. And as a prank, I stole the little thing and I made a ransom note and um, a videotape of me uh, where you couldn't see that it was me and my friend. Uh, We had like a cap gun put up to Gargamel's head and we're doing things like pretending that we ran him over and um, all this other kind of stuff like that, like uh, really just ridiculous stuff. And... We did, we took it to the next level. We had uh, the second day, we put another tape out there, and it was this whole, like, the death and resurrection of it. So we had, like, this little coffin. We had the, the weird visuals from 2001 A Space Odyssey playing, and all that kind of weird, absolutely crazy shit that you would never fucking be able to do in, you know, 2019 high school because we would have been called into, you know, social services or something like that. Mm-hmm. But two years later, my junior year of high school, I had seen that that same teacher who I didn't have anymore. I only had it in my freshman year. Uh, he had a stuffed reindeer, and he used to have like pretty much every class had these like planters hanging up at the ceiling. And I was just like, you know, what? I'm gonna just do something with that. So I had this like string. It was not like string string. It was more like a little bit of a rope. So I tied it uh, into like a little bit of a noose, and I hanged it on his um thing like with the plants and i had a little suicide note on it that said they wouldn't let me play any reindeer games <laughs> and, 
didn't tell anybody ahead of time I was doing this and all that other kind of stuff. So he comes into my classroom because we were across the hall from him, and he's just like, "Mango, I know that this was you. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else will be sick enough to hang my right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love, I love it. It's a good <laughs> insight to the warped mind of Tony Mango. <laughs> And really, he guys, lo- he loved it. Let he, people play reindeer games. Yeah, it's just you know, and watch the movie Reindeer Games. It's at least for a laugh. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's side notes out of the way. Uh, that kind of explains. I won't do it because I'm not British, but I have William Regal shouting "Reindeer Games" in my head. <laughs> oh my god! Reindeer Games. <laughs> reindeer. <laughs> We should get Callum to do the whole, oh, reindeer games, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that I did that should probably explain the fact that I fucking loved Brock Lesnar versus Rey Mysterio. Oh, so fucking fun. I normally do not like Brock Lesnar matches. And that, I mean, that's the whole point of the Brock Lesnar rule is the whole, oh, uh, he beat the crap out of the person. I get it. Or uh, he put up a little bit of a fight, but he beat the crap out of the person. German suplex. Germans. This was fucking fun. I loved him just throwing him around. I liked the addition of Dominic coming in there and trying to mess around a little bit there, but then Brock just being like, this is it. That's over. Here's an F5. You're fucking done. One, two, three. I enjoyed the hell out of this. This was actually probably my third favorite thing in the night, the two elimination matches being number one and number two. Oddly, yeah, major thumb up. Dude, so, so good. Brock Lesnar, I, I don't want to skip right to the end here, but Dominic basically gets in the ring. Uh, Dominic and Ray low blow him. They do a double 619. Ray Mysterio wins Father of the Year by telling his son to go back up to the top rope after two frog splashes from each of them didn't work. And Brock Lesnar German suplexes the poor kid and then catches Ray like a baby and hit him <laughs> with the fucking F5 because no, he is Brock Lesnar. And you might even say, Tony, he made Rim Mysterio look like a bit of a clown. <laughs> I see what you did there. I like this a whole lot. And, uh, if we got more stuff that was logical like this, it made sense with Lesnar. It was only a seven minute match. And so that's, by no means, like, some, you know, super long, oh, he wrestled a fucking Iron Man situation, and that's all the difference. Brock Lesnar doesn't have to do that for me to like him. All the time that I criticize Brock Lesnar, it's not criticizing his potential. It's criticizing the way that they book him. In this match, this made perfect sense. So it's like, what would I have to complain about? Rey Mysterio had to do that kind of stuff to put up a fight, and he had to get his ass whooped. I did start thinking that Ray would win. And when Dominic came out and they did that, there was a part of me that was like, you know what? Maybe the is going to happen. And then I started thinking, well, I don't know if they'd really give Dominic that thing. If it was another person that came out, like Cain Velasquez, then I would have been like, oh, crap. I need to start changing it to say that Brock Lesnar's losing that title. But the fact that they got me to even think that for a split second means that this worked. Yeah. I thought it as well. You know, they did the double pin, and I thought, oh my god, it's a miracle. I could hear Jerry Lawler, who, by the way, lost track of the count, but he did his little shriek about t- ten times tonight. The little, ah! ah! Oh my god! <laughs> it's like, okay, okay, Jerry, take it down a notch. But it worked, and I want to see more of Brock Lesnar like this. I don't know how you do that. I know not everybody's as close with Brock as Ray is, so maybe you can't do the thing where you actually get Brock Lesnar motivated, but this was fucking fun. Now, again, I got to look at the roster, and I got to say, I just don't think you can go really positive directions from here. I'm worried about that. Like, I don't think that Brock has any viable challengers on Raw without potentially building up Kevin Owens. So all you have left is Kevin Owens? And if you do Kevin Owens at Rumble, then what do you do at Mania? So I'm going to... I have no prior knowledge to anything. I'm just going to say 
maybe at Rumble. Fuck it, it's John Cena. Because I mean, we're probably both in agreement here, and I'm assuming everybody listening is as well. Brock's not fighting at TLC. He won't fight at TLC. Uh, they don't go for the Minneapolis pop with Lesnar, but it is in Minneapolis. I don't think it's happening. He'd work December. He'd be working far too many pay-per-views compared to his normal shtick. How many has he done this year? He's done... He did Rumble. He did Mania. He yeah, did... I don't, I don't think he did Elimination Chamber or Fastlane, right? No, he did Rumble, Griffey. he did Mania. He did the the first Saudi show, Super Showdown. He did Money in the Bank. Yeah, Money in the Bank. He did SummerSlam. He did Extreme Rules. He did SummerSlam. Uh, so, the second Saudi show. The, the second Saudi show. Crown Jewel. What was the September pay per view? He did uh, wrestle the two second match on SmackDown. Right. So, and he did this show. So he's done eight pay per views this year. Which is absurd compared to the, the stuff in the past. And it's so much better, even though the fact that I didn't want to see. Even if it's that. like you can argue the point that maybe it was about. 50 minutes combined. He did eight pay-per-views this year. So, so I don't think it's happening at TLC. No, nah, that's fair. Ultimately, they can do some other matches and they can fill up that card. It's like, it's not Survivor Series where you've got like seven hours to fill or whatever. So they can do Reigns versus Corbin, women's tag titles, Bailey defends the title against somebody. I'm assuming either Lacey or Carmella. Uh, they could do the Raw tag titles on the line if they want to put somebody against them. They could do the SmackDown tag titles on the line. They could do the Intercontinental title on the line. Bray Wyatt in the Triple Threat. That's already seven matches. But you still run into the issue of who's on that roster that can fight him. Once you come around to WrestleMania and the whole backtrack into the Royal Rumble thing, that's where the issue is. Because you got to either turn somebody or you got to build somebody up or you got to just disappoint people. Because if their game plan is to do Seth Rollins again, it's going to bomb. Yeah. And, I mean, you, we can rule out, like, at the very least, we can rule out the idea. It's not going to be Akum. It's not going to be Akira Tozawa. I highly doubt it's going to be Aleister Black. I just can't see that happening. Maybe he could get a cheap, like, seven-minute match at the Rumble. I don't even think that that's close. Andrade, that's not happening. They've got Kevin Owens and... Realistically, like, the the only people that have chances, even ignoring the fact that it's, like, some of them are heels or whatever like that, the only people who are names on Monday Night Raw are AJ Styles... Bobby Lashley, Drew McIntyre, Kevin Owens, Randy Orton, Rey Mysterio, which they're already getting out of the way, Samoa Joe, maybe, and Seth Rollins. Those are the only options from now until WrestleMania, which might even be after that, because we don't know if we're going to get like a superstar shakeup or something, too. So, Kevin Owens at Mania, Randy at the Rumble. Yeah, I think that that might end up being their, their way around it. Because it does seem like Randy Orton's kind of more on the babyface side right now. Mm -hmm. And that might be their game plan is being like, we'll set him up for that. He can lose and do that kind of thing. And there is Rusev, technically. But with this Bobby Lashley storyline, they're not going to push him to fight him. Or unless they really want to do... You could even do like babyface Lesnar, as weird as it seems, against Lashley. And that's just crazy to me to think that like that this Lana thing is where they want to lead all the way leading up to that. I can't, I cannot believe. I've seen them. Remember when they did uh, Randy and Lesnar last time, and they just straight up announced it, like, "Hey, it's SummerSlam." This is happening. Have fun. And I can't believe they haven't done that with Lashley and Lesnar. It's such a given matchup. They have such parallel careers. 
So I'm worried about that. I'm worried that WrestleMania this year is going to have two world title matches that are underwhelming. And for that matter, I'm also kind of worried about the women's title situation. Because our final match of this night was Shayna Baszler, Becky Lynch, and Bailey. Shayna Baszler gets to win by making Bailey tap out. And I'm looking at those rosters right now, and I'm thinking the same kind of thing. I'm thinking, well, if Bailey's still the champion, or if she drops it to anybody, I don't see anything being worthwhile on SmackDown. It's as simple as this. It's Bailey, Sasha, and Mania. And it's Becky Lynch, Ronda Rousey. And I'm not saying anything to the contrary until somebody proves me that until we get past the Royal Rumble and Ronda's just not there. Well, I thought that Ronda was going to show up on this. I sure did. The fact that they put that at the very last thing, I was thinking, okay, they did that for a reason. Ronda Rousey's going to help Shayna Baszler win. And There, there was a moment where I think... She had Shayna in the disarmor, and I'm waiting for uh, Joan Jett to come over the loudspeaker because I'm like, all right, Ronda's just going to show up. She'll help Shayna win, and we're off to the races. And they made it even more convoluted by Shayna wins, but Becky fucks her up just to send the crowd home happy. Yeah, that was underwhelming. At that point, after NXT had really dominated the night, I fully expected to go off the air with Hunter and Sean and everybody crowding the ring, being like, NXT, NXT, you know, that, but we got, hey, Becky Lynch is still the man, which was just a weird take Becky must it. pose. <laughs> yeah, it, it was kind of like a Becky must pose. It's like, I know that Bailey's a sacrificial lamb here, but we talked about the idea that she could have potentially pinned Bailey or Becky. And oh, by the way, let's talk it. about this. This match sucked. Like, I can't lie. This match, for me, was really bad. See, I thought it was fine. Like, again, I don't remember a whole lot of positives, a whole lot of negatives about a lot of specific matches and stuff, but I don't remember being bothered by it. If I went back and I rewatched some of these matches, I might think differently of them. I, I just didn't like it at all. I thought it was slow. I thought it was plotting. You could hear audible boring chants. There was a point in this match where Becky Lynch was just down and out for way too long because it's a triple threat match. Yeah, that, that's always bothersome. Um, and then Bailey was the sacrificial lamb. Nothing about this match to me screamed, okay, this needs to go on last. Yeah, because nothing happened. But so maybe, it's... is that an archaic belief that the last match should mean something? And, you know, because I hear often, oh, it's different now. But why should it be? Like, movies have the same structure. You have the initial incident, you build up, you reach the climax, you know, all that stuff. Wrestling events should do the same thing. If they are, they are making movies, that whole thing. Like, the main event is not something that you can control for something like uh, like MMA or boxing or whatever. Like, they could have, like, a hell of a fight on the pre-show, and it could be the best fight of the whole thing. Now, the main event for those things is just flat out who is the big name, who is the big draw. For wrestling, you don't have to do that. You can do whatever the best match is or the most important thing or anything along those lines. And you can't even kind of justify it as saying, like, well, we needed it to end with a babyface winning because Shayna won. She wasn't really a babyface. She kind of is when you say that it's NXT and they're going to get cheered, so maybe that was their justification. Because it does make more sense for this to be the main event than, like, the Roderick Strong match. Give them that. I'll admit, going into it, I did feel like, hey, it was the best built match. It should go on last. But by the time I got out of it, I'm like, all right, it didn't feel like a big match. And I'm not really, I'm not really feeling it. I think that the five on five on five men's match 
Should have been last. I agree. And Reigns would have won. That's kind of like a baby face. Closing out the night in a good way. But then you can't do that because you're like, hey, SmackDown got two. Well, they ended it with NXT one. So that's kind of weird. But now I'm like, all right, well, we didn't get Ronda Rousey. And where do we go? Like, if you turn Sasha or Bailey, technically speaking, they are the biggest names on that brand. So that's, I guess, something, but I don't fucking care. And I think that they both should stay heels. And there's no baby faces that really stand up. And, you know, oh, Lacey Evans versus Bailey. I don't care to see that. That's not WrestleMania for me. So I'm starting to think more so that SmackDown's going to fall into that pit where it's Bailey, Sasha, Lacey, Carmella, whatever. It's a six pack challenge. And then for Raw, they better not be doing the whole thing where they think that they can do Charlotte and Becky again because that's not going to go over all that well either. I'm still I... holding out a little bit of hope that it's Ronda Rousey, but even with that, I got to admit, if Ronda Rousey just comes in, wins the Royal Rumble, and faces Becky Lynch, I've already seen it. I don't care. Yeah, that's wrong. You think you've seen it, but you haven't seen it one-on-one. Uh, I've seen them fight. They forced Charlotte into the story this year. It bugs me when it seems like WrestleMania is not a priority. Anymore, kind of. yeah. Like, I mean, everything, there are examples of better and worse. So keep that in mind. But I liked the idea that, for instance, Randy Savage wins the title and Hulk Hogan's a part of the whole celebration and throughout the year, you build towards Randy Savage versus Hulk Hogan. I like that because you didn't see Randy Savage versus Hulk Hogan in the finals to win that championship and then just do a repeat. WWE seems to want to do something like that, but they don't want to put in the effort and they want to just do the repeats. Like we did the once in a lifetime thing with The Rock. Now, we had The Miz and the whole Rock thing. But I can argue that that was like, okay, they're going to do that because they want to build it up to the next year's WrestleMania. And then they just said, let's just do it again. And I was like, well, that's not trying. And with Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, they were kind of building Roman Reigns up as being like the guy who could take down Brock Lesnar. And they did that whole swerve with Seth Rollins. A couple years later, they just go, let's just do that one again. Well, shit. Like, you're not trying, you know? And if this is just a matter of them saying, because remember... After WrestleMania last year, tons of reports saying we have an idea in mind for Becky Lynch at WrestleMania next and year. And it's not Ronda. And it's, and it's not Charlotte, and it's not Ronda. And it's not Stephanie. That was the other one. So then it might just be Shayna. It might be. And in, in that case, they didn't do enough, I think, in this match to build to the idea that it could have been like, okay, well, Becky and Shayna are going to have something at WrestleMania. And then, of course, you got to take the title off of Shayna, and then she's got to win the Royal Rumble, or she's got to win the Elimination at least, Chamber. At the very least, that's set up. Rhea Ripley's taking the title off Shayna Baszler. More than likely, I think that that's the case. My and other, then, the other like, thing we're not talking about, Charlotte Flair. Well, Charlotte was the next thing I was going to say, which was at that point, what do you do with Charlotte? Because do you just move her over to SmackDown? Well, then you got to move over Andrade and you got to move over Alistair and you got to move over Selena. So then that defeats that whole thing. So then what do they do? They just flat out do Shayna versus Becky versus Charlotte and they do the same thing, but it's fucking Shayna Baszler instead of Ronda Rousey. Do you do Becky? Does Becky pull double duty and defend the tag belts? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's, this is one it's of those years because... where they have to just say, admit that maybe Charlotte shouldn't be the thing in everything all the time, and maybe Charlotte wins the Battle Royal. Which should be the China Memorial Battle Royal. And it will be. I strongly believe it will be. I don't think so. The think issue I have it. with that is it's I don't think there should be women's mid-card titles. Let me just say that, first of all. But men's rosters are taken for granted with their depth. Like, if this happens to Roman Reigns, 
which it rarely does. But Roman just fights Drew McIntyre, or, you know... Unless, maybe this is what they do. Now, a couple months from now, we might be calling ourselves crazy for talking about the ideas like this, but, you know, what the hell. What happened at SummerSlam? Charlotte fought Trish Mm -hmm. in a random featured match. And like you said, when you pointed out Roman Reigns right there, what happens when you've got a big enough name on the men's roster and there isn't a championship involved? They tend to get some kind of featured match. It's sort of The Undertaker versus CM Punk. It's, uh, you know, Roman Reigns versus Drew McIntyre, whatever the case may be. Seth Rollins versus Randy Orton. What if the game plan isn't to have the tag team titles on the line? Because right now they also they don't have uh, the cruiserweight title that they need to do anymore. That's one less match that they need to figure out for WrestleMania. And last year they crammed a bunch of stuff in. They had all the titles on the line. We didn't have the twenty four seven title at the time, but it didn't really matter. Or did we? We did not. I didn't think that we did. Yeah. So that's not really. They're not going to do a match. If anything, at WrestleMania they would do like a backstage segment. So. Becky versus Ronda or Becky versus Shayna. Some kind of multi-woman match for SmackDown just because it's like, let's cram in some star power or whatever. Women's tag titles, maybe they're just not a part of the mix. Maybe they're in the uh, Battle Royal. And then we get Charlotte Flair versus some kind of legend. I don't really know who. But yeah, that's my next question. Who's left? Maybe it's Lita. Like, maybe she just does the whole, like, hey, you retired Trish, and, you know, now I want to step up and whatever. Or maybe it's, like, the retirement of somebody else. Like, I don't think that this would be the case, but maybe somebody like Natty, maybe she wants to just kind of retire. Maybe it's, like, this is my last match, and I'm going to fight Charlotte, or... I don't know. She, like, all but all those matches are pretty meh. Yeah. Well, I mean, Charlotte versus Lita, if they were to do that, they would make it seem like it's... They would promote it. It's the second like, coming yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. Now, Charlotte versus Natty. You're not going to buy that for anybody. Sorry, Natty. But now, like, what you if know, that's Ronda where... wins the Rumble and it's just Shayna versus Charlotte? But where would Shayna Charlotte come in? Shayna is in the Rumble. And maybe even she just moves up. To the all right, roster. maybe hold on. Maybe Becky and Charlotte win the tag titles, and they lose it to the other horsewomen on NXT. Yeah. And then that's where you get okay. It's Ronda, Becky, Shayna, Charlotte. Because like I'm not not putting Charlotte in a big match. Charlotte needs to be in a featured match at all times. And she's earned that spot. I don't even feel like that's favoritism or nepotism in any way. She's earned that spot. The whole thing just kind of makes me think that they have no plan. And I was really hoping that at the end of Survivor Series that we would have a little bit of a game plan going on and some kind of indication of what's going forward. Now I'm getting a little worried. Who knows? I think it'll be good, though. Whatever they do, I'm sure it'll be good. I'm not sure. <laughs> but what I am sure about is that that's all that I have to say about Survivor Series. Is there anything else that you think that we should talk to, uh, talk about that we haven't? I don't think so. I think that pretty much covers it. We'll know more as we get towards, you know, not even the next pay-per-view point, which is TLC, but the Royal Rumble itself. I think that's when things will open up and you'll know what you're dealing with. We might even know a little bit more when it comes to Starcade. I highly doubt it, but this episode of Raw that's coming up, the episode of NXT coming up, and the episode of SmackDown, they might just kind of roll out some ideas and just sort of be like, you know what, this person's feeding with this person now. Now the Survivor Series done, let's kick it into the next step uh, towards the whole WrestleMania thing. Or more than likely, they wait another week or so. But of course, anything that we do find out, I will update the website as soon as I can about all the information of whatever the different events are, and we'll talk about that when it comes time to it. 
I already did my plugs, but you got some plugs to toss out there. Go ahead. Uh, Fightful.com. It's a great... It's. I'm not kissing ass when I say at this point, Fightful.com in my eyes is the best wrestling news website to go to. You're not waiting for one weekly massive update like the Observer. It's always from verified sources, a lot of which go on the record. If you subscribe to Fightful Select, you'll see stuff from, you know, several Ring of Honor names about all the issues they have going on right now. Fightful is wrestling news done right. And when I'm not over at Fightful on the weekends, I'm also on WrestleZone.com, which is got a lot of history to it and one of the better aggregate sites, I would say, and it's a lot of fun. I do the WrestleZone Daily podcast Monday through Thursday, and you can check that out on the Facebook page or on iTunes or Stitcher or anywhere you get your podcasts. And I'm also on your wrestling news. So click around. You'll see my name pop up a lot of different places. And... Yeah, 2001 a Wrestling Odyssey, where Cal Miggins and I go back in time to the year 2001. The November episode should be up relatively shortly. I believe we're recording on Black Friday. And that's it for me. Oh, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at DudeFelice. You know, all these times that you're going back in time to 2001, you don't warn me about anything. I know. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, I think I did all my plugs, but also on top of that, you should be following so the social media accounts. Follow on Facebook and Twitter at Smart Cal Moment. Follow the Fanboys Anonymous stuff. Follow a mango tree for kind of pretty much everything, just kind of in one lump sum sort of situation. Follow me personally at Tony Mango and pay attention to all those different sites for anything that could potentially come in your way because even I don't know exactly what's happening all the time and as much as I try to work constantly and he doesn't even I'm have able a to... pulse guys like yeah that's <laughs> <laughs> that's very strange <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that but uh you know who knows maybe some kind of special stuff coming up if I get the time maybe I'm gonna be too swamped and not gonna be able to do anything other than the normal kind of stuff but we also have champs giving going on right now and that is going to switch over to the finals for next week. I'm going to put that up on Tuesday. And that's going to be determining who the best hardcore champion of all time is from WWE. So go ahead and vote for that while you can. Round four is still up. And we've got Starcade coming up this week. So we're going to do the predictions in some form. I'm going to do it on the website up to date every day that they switch something if they do. And we'll do the podcast either as part of the hot tags or we're going to do it on some separate thing. We also have the mailbag, so I know that we've gotten some questions from here and there from different people. Send in those as soon as you can, the sooner the better, so that way we have some time to actually like look at the questions, go through, try to figure out some answers and stuff. And we're probably going to be doing that on Wednesday, so send them in at the very least by like Tuesday afternoon or so. And then uh, we will do the whole Starcade thing after Starcade, and then we'll move on after that. Talk about the Champs Giving tournament, wrap everything up, and start moving into the TLC talk a little bit after that. Before you know it, it's going to be the Smart Cat Moment End of the Year Awards. It's like, you know, a couple weeks away. So, yeah, that's what's coming up next. Stay tuned. Show your support in any way that you can. It's all greatly appreciated. And we'll see you next time, everybody. This has been another Smart Cat Moment, and we're being counted out.